Hey everyone, welcome to Silver Creek Fellowship. My name's Corey, I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for being with us today. Our Thursday church preaching series is on the parables of Jesus. These messages are from services that happened at Silver Creek Fellowship in 2018. Even though they were intended for a live audience a couple of years ago, we believe the truth in these messages is still relevant and helpful for us today. Tonight, we're going to worship by singing a few songs together. We're going to learn from the Bible, but right now at this moment, I want to encourage you to participate by giving. We've been able to help so many people in these days with all sorts of physical needs. And more than meeting physical needs, our church is working together to make sure people are spiritually healthy through this difficult time. And we're doing our best to serve those around us and share Jesus' love. We got a note just a few weeks ago that said, the online services and connections through church have been incredibly helpful through these isolated times. I want to encourage you right now to take a moment and give to support what God is doing here through our church. If you're watching live with us, you can click the giving box in the chat. It won't interrupt your view of the service, so you can do it right now. You can also give anytime by visiting scf.tv giving or mailing your check to P.O. Box 8 in Silverton. Besides giving financially, I want to encourage you, if you're able, to help one of our ministries. We're finding all sorts of ways to encourage and help people throughout this pandemic. And if you want to help, go to scf.tv and click the Give Help button. Please fill out a connection card tonight. And if you'd like prayer during this service, click on the live prayer button. One of our prayer team will pray with you right now. Now, we're going to worship. Please sing with us. God is good, so let's praise him together. Grave, 
So today, I get the opportunity to continue in a series of sermons that I've been doing on Thursday nights. I've been able to share a couple of them with you on Sundays um, through the parables of Jesus. Now, I get the question often on Thursdays, how many more of these parables do you think we'll do? And then I pull out the list and look at how many more there are to do and say, well, a few. I, I don't know. We're, we're going to keep going until we don't keep going, and then we'll probably pick it back up at some other point. But as we begin today, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a plan or had a discussion about what you would save in your house if all of a sudden the house was on fire? Now, we're talking no time to dilly-dally, right? We're talking fire, and you are on the way to the door, but on your way to the door, you're going to grab that one thing. Now, for some people, this is easy, like Josiah. He's immediately going to grab his Nick, Nicolas Cage complete box set DVD collection of all 89 of his films because this is his prized possession, right? But for the rest of us, you may, you may not know exactly what you would grab. See, and actually, as you age, what you would pick up, what you would grab drastically changes. I can remember as a kid living out on Cascade Highway on the farm that if there was a fire, I was going to grab my Thundercats action figure collection. There was no way the fire was going to get to those. And late, as I aged a little bit and got into middle school and was collecting a lot of sports cards, I, was gonna, I had one binder of sports cards that my most valuable cards were kept in. My complete Bo Jackson football and baseball collection, my Michael Jordan collection, my Clyde Drexler's. It was not going to taste the fire. Now as an adult, if my family's outside, right, let it burn, right? But if my family is safe, I want my family albums. I want maybe my wife's journals. But once my family's out, I'm pretty all right. Now, I've got a life point before I ever get into the text today that I'd like you to see and like you to write down in your notes if you're taking notes with me today. And that life point is this. The value that you place on something is shown by what you will give up for it. The value that you place on something is shown by what you will give up for it. Now, do you have anything in your possession, in your home, that for whatever reason you have determined is priceless to you? That thing that's been handed down, that thing that's so important to you that regardless of what its physical value is, you've determined is priceless. See, when Jesus talked about finding the kingdom of God, he used a story. He used terms like these. He taught that finding the kingdom of God was like discovering something that was so incredibly valuable that you would gladly give up everything else that you ever have had in order to get a hold of it. Now, he taught this through the two shortest parables in the Bible out of Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to look at those today, but I already saw when I said shortest parable, some of you were worried you will be getting a full-length sermon today despite the length of the parables, okay? So we're going to look at the parable first, uh, and then we'll dive in. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything he owned and bought it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And we also thank you for your spirit that helps us to understand your word. We pray in this place today, Holy Spirit, that you would move that you would bring the word of God to life, that you would, as scripture says, help us, God, it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it's able to teach us and train us and we want to see that happen in our life today. And so we pray for your help in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so always before I dive into the parable, I like to look at the context of where Jesus was teaching this particular story. So in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus has just finished teaching these massive crowds, a series of four agriculturally themed parables. He's moved through the seed and the soil, the weeds, the mustard seed, and the yeast. And after Jesus finishes these parables with the crowds, the Gospel of Matthew tells us that now he takes the disciples inside, indoors, away from the crowds. Listening to this particular parable and a couple of others is just Jesus's closest followers. 
Jesus had often taught these massive crowds and the disciples at the same time. But this particular instance, Jesus decides these parables are just for the disciples. And I think at least we can say that these parables are particularly important for the disciples. And that means for us as well as disciples as we grow in our life of discipleship. See, Jesus wants to be sure that the disciples fully understand these particular truths. And he even asks them after the next parable, do you understand what I'm telling you? And they agree. Yes, we do understand. See, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the truths contained in these two short parables are some of the most significant truths truths for us to understand to shape our Christian life, a life of discipline, a life of training in the kingdom of God. So Jesus tells these two very similar stories, and he makes one very distinct point. In the first story, a man stumbles upon a treasure randomly. We don't know exactly what he was doing in the field. Maybe he was a hired hand They're out plowing a field, or maybe he was taking a shortcut on his way home, or maybe he was burying a dead body. Whatever, we don't know. All we know is there was a man, and it was a field that he did not own when he discovers this priceless treasure. Now, by the way, who here has not dreamed of discovering treasure somewhere, right? You may not know this about me, but I'm a super huge nerd, okay? And I nerd out about a lot of different types of things. But one of the things that has been a common theme through my whole life is this quest, this love of stories about treasure. For some reason, I've always, for this reason, I've always loved pirates, right? Because pirates are adults on treasure hunts, right? So I've always loved stories about pirates. I love them so much that when my wife and I got an opportunity to go on vacation, we went to the Caribbean so that we could see St. Thomas where Blackbeard's Castle is located because it combined my love of history, pirates, and sunshine, okay? So it was a great vacation, Now, I'm one of those guys who watches the History Channel show Oak Island every single week, even though it's an absolutely terrible show, and I know each week that nothing's going to be found, but it could be, right? It could be the episode where they finally unlock the, the mystery. One of these stories I was recently reading was a story about this man named Terry Herbert. Now, Terry is a man living in Great Britain whose neighbor was a farmer, and his neighbor was out working on a project and lost his very favorite hammer. Now, he came over to Terry because Terry was one of those guys who often spent time sweeping his backyard with a metal detector. And so he goes to his neighbor's house in search for this hammer, and instead of finding a hammer, he discovers the largest Anglo-Saxon treasure hoard ever discovered with more than five million dollars in gold in this man's backyard, okay? Like, now, who's got a metal detector and is going home, right? Yeah. See, I used to garage sale every single weekend because garage selling is just that. It's adult treasure hunting, right? You go and you'd look. Now, this was back in the good old days, the early 2000s, when people were still scared of that thing, the internet, right? And so there was this new thing called eBay, but everyone was so scared of eBay that there was actually stores that you would take your stuff to and they would sell it for you on eBay because, you know, I couldn't sell something myself online. I have to take it to a store to do that. Well, I loved eBay, and so I started making a lot of money picking items at garage sales. In fact, that vacation to St. Thomas was paid for by going to garage sales and then selling the things on eBay. Now, I'm telling you this story because I'm going to tell you my great treasure story. Now, one day I was driving in Salem, actually on Kubler, just about to turn on to commercial. This day, my wife was riding with me, and we saw a sign for a yard sale. Now, I can't pass a sign for a yard sale, and so I turned. It was pretty early in the morning, so when we pulled in, Summer, who is really, really wonderful, but um, at this point, she was like, just go. I'll sit in the car. So I was like, great. You know. So I hopped out and started looking at the yard sale. Now, I'm the guy. The yard sale was not open yet, right? She was still pricing the things, but I immediately lock on and see this wooden chest, this old wooden chest, in the yard. So when I walk over to the wooden chest, I open the lid and look in, and it gets really good. I notice this emblem that I know well. 
And I open up the book inside to discover the entire first edition of 1963 Spider Marvel comic books. I'm flipping through these and I'm getting really excited. But I can't let her see that, right? I'm at a yard sale. So I'm just flipping through it. I put it back down. I close the lid. I casually walk over and ask her how much for the comic book collection. And she tells me a story. Her father has recently passed away. And she's come from the East Coast to liquidate her father's possessions. And she's just overwhelmed by all of it. And so she says, you can have them all for $100. I say, mm, $100. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll take him. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, now, you may not be nerdy like me, so you may not be following along with the story. In 2011, that one comic book, The Amazing Spider-Man, the first appearance of Spider-Man, sold at auction for $1.1 million. One of those books. And he had the entire first series. Now, I don't have... Yeah. Yeah. I don't have $100 in my pocket, but luckily commercial is right there and my bank is on commercial... And so uh, I say, okay, I'll take them. I'm going to go to the bank, get the money. She marks them sold. I turn and walk towards the car. And as I'm walking towards the car, I'm no longer able, right, to hide my excitement. I get inside the car and I, my, it pops, right? I'm, I'm telling Summer about this once in 10 lifetimes treasure, about how everything is going to change, about how wonderful all of this is going to be. I'm going crazy, and she's not going crazy, in fact, she gives me that you know what you need to do look. The same look the Holy Spirit, by the way, had been giving me since I discovered this comic book. And so after some discussion with both her and the Holy Spirit, I got back out of the car, walked over to the lady and told her that her father's comic book collection was not worth $100, but it was worth hundreds of thousands. And now guess what? Her look was the same as my look used to be, right? She was so excited. She was overwhelmed. Because why? Treasure had been discovered. We dream of finding treasure, don't we? In Jesus' day, it was no different. In Jesus' day, it was a common occurrence for somebody to bury their life's uh, money, their treasure out in a field. Why? Because their villages were constantly, especially in Israel, they were constantly having raids come into town. In fact, in the story of the unfaithful steward, the parable of the unfaithful steward, remember, what does he do with the one talent Jesus gave him? He sticks it in the ground to keep it safe. Okay, This was a common occurrence. In the archaeological digs that are going on in Qumran, that's the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They actually discovered in that place a map that showed 64 different locations that the people living in that community had placed their or deposited their treasure so that if people were killed from the community, at least somebody could go back and gather these things up. So now this man, he's out in the field and he discovers this amazing treasure. And apparently that day his wife was not traveling with him, okay? Because he, he reburies, he reburies the treasure and he goes and he sells absolutely everything he's got. And I want to show you three of the absolute most important words in this parable that you can write down. It is these, in his joy. Now, normally... If you had to walk away from everything that you have ever owned, you'd be devastated. But this man is not devastated. He is elated because the joy he has from finding this treasure is because it is so much more valuable than anything that he's walking away from. And Jesus says, this is like finding the kingdom of God. The second parable makes the same point with a few small distinctions. This time, the one who discovers the treasure, a pearl of great price, he's not a blue-collar worker, but he's a very wealthy merchant. And unlike the first guy, this guy doesn't discover the treasure accidentally. This guy has made a lifetime career of pursuing and hunting treasure. 
Pearls, by the way, were the most valuable jewel of the ancient world, mainly because they were so hard to get. Think about it. Today, we farm pearls. Today, you can still go out and get scuba gear and go down to where the pearls are. But in the ancient world, coming across pearls was definitely, definitely not such an easy thing. And so a pearl merchant, in order to find the right pearls, would have searched the world all by ship, port to port, to port, hunting, searching for the ever-elusive treasure. I'm a history geek, I tell you that each time. And the famous Roman historian, Pliny the Elder, this is what he said about pearls. He said, the first place and the topmost rank among all things of price is held by pearls. Their whole value lies in their brilliance, their size, their roundness, their smoothness, and their weight. There have been two pearls, that were the largest in the whole of history. Both were owned by Cleopatra. They had come down to her through the hands of the kings of the east. Now, these two pearls that Cleopatra had were said to be worth, in today's terms, over $4 billion. And the majority of her wealth was contained in these two pearls. Now, this merchant made a living traveling the world, searching and buying pearls. But this one, when he sees it, is as of such exquisite beauty that he's willing to sell all the other pearls he's collected, sell his house, sell his business, sell his fleet, sell his land to possess that one pearl. Two men, one blue collar, one white collar. One with relatively little, the other with a lot. One who's looking for treasure, one who stumbles across treasure, and another one who's obsessed with treasure. One poor and common, the other rich and educated. But both of them encounter something of such immense value that it makes everything else in their life look worthless by comparison. And Jesus said, this is like discovering the kingdom of God. So I've got a main point for you to write down today. The kingdom of God woos us with a greater joy. The kingdom of God woos us with a greater joy. Let me ask you, is that how you view God's kingdom? That it's offering you, that it's wooing you with a greater joy than you could ever hope or even imagine to experience in any other place. That coming to Jesus means you can finally experience true joy and not just a little but fullness of joy. See, I told you that in his joy may be the most important words in these parables. And that normally, if you told me you have to give up everything, if you had to lose everything, that would mean we'd be devastated. Yet, this man is filled with joy. Let me ask you a question. Is this a metaphor? This metaphor that Jesus used to describe his kingdom, about finding something so wonderful, so valuable, that with joy and gladness, you would willingly give up everything else that you have? Would you use this metaphor to describe your encounter with the kingdom of God? That it was like finding a treasure that's brought you so much joy that you would gladly leave everything else to possess it? See, I think many of us, if we're honest, might choose a different picture or image. Maybe for you, discovering the kingdom of God feels like you've encountered a never-ending to-do list of things that you constantly feel guilty about. And maybe for others of you, discovering the kingdom of God, you feel like it's like being tied to a ball and chain, that it weighs you down and it keeps you from having fun, that you have to do this ball and chain thing because you don't want to go to hell. So you're willing to give up your happiness for your security. And that just shows us how little we actually understand about who Jesus and what Jesus is offering us. See, what the kingdom and the kingdom of God's life is all about. See, this parable confronts a deeply ingrained myth that's happening right now in our culture. And that is that God is upset at us because we desire to be happy. So I've got a life point for you to write in. God is not 
upset at you because you want to be happy. God is not upset with you because you want to be happy. See, many people think that. I used to think that. I used to uh, believe that sin and the world were fun, and God wanted me to walk away from fun and get religious. See, I always felt wrongly that the message at youth camp was this. You know, the problem, kids, with people is that they want to be happy. So we're going to have an altar call after the service. And if you come up and surrender your right and desire to be happy, and I would think, well, I guess, I mean, I'd rather be miserable in this life than spend eternity being miserable, right? So I'll trade my eternal soul in exchange for my earthly happiness. But think of it like this. Say that on my wedding day, my wife stood at the altar, and my dad married us, so he said, okay, Summer, it's your turn to say your vows. And she said, I hereby today renounce all of my desire for romance, for physical intimacy, for pleasure, and happiness till death do us part. I'd say, no, no. I don't want you to give up those things. I want to discover the depths of those things together with you. Did you know that it doesn't glorify God when we serve him out of duty? See, far too many of us have come to Jesus and his kingdom because we were afraid of the alternative. We don't want to go to hell, so I guess we'll come to Jesus. But did you know that fear is a lousy motivator for discipleship? And fear can never transform you daily into the image of Jesus. Let me ask you, how many loving, passionate, fruitful marriages do you know of where the husband and wife are terrified to death of each other? So here's how I would like us to think about it. Back to the life point. God's not upset at you because you want to be happy. He's upset for you. Because you choose to be happy in things besides him. See, this is what we mean when we say that God is a jealous God. He's not jealous because he's insecure. He knows he is the only one that can truly make you happy. So he's jealous for your sake. See, He wants the very best for each and every one of your life. And he knows the very best for each of you is himself. He wants you to live a life full of joy, overflowing with joy. And he knows the only way for that to be possible is through his son, Jesus Christ. And in his joy, did you know that joy is the only thing that can sustain you in your Christian life? Nehemiah 8.10, he says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy, not the strength of your will, not the strength that comes like in modern world thinking, the inner strength where we grit and bear through our trials. No, it says the joy of the Lord will be the thing that is our strength. The strength of your will is never, ever going to be enough to keep you faithful. We have to constantly, daily, be consumed by a greater joy. See, those who thrive in the Christian life, who grow, and who are being transformed into the image of Jesus day by day, are those whose Jesus is their joy. Jesus as their first desire. Jesus as their passion. Not just as a life insurance policy. See, the kingdom of God woos us. With greater joy. I think so many of us are missing this. And why I think so, just to be frank, so many Christians are absolutely miserable. Because they have no idea of the potential joy that Jesus is offering them in the Christian life. One of the memory verses that I have on my screen that I'm working on right now is Psalm 4-7. Maybe you should memorize this one too. It says this. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. A better joy 
than what we get from food or friends or riches. Have you ever had an experience in your life where you experienced a new joy that made the other joys look like a lot less? This happened to me when I held my son Keegan for the first time. Now, I was older when we had kids. I was 33 years old when I first got to hold my son. And people had told me for years. But here's the thing. I didn't believe them because I had nothing to relate it to, right? And all of a sudden, I'm looking down and holding this boy. And I'm going, oh. If somebody would have burst in the room and said, Kurt, your house is burning down. Somebody stole your car. I would have said, have you seen my son? Because everything in that instant changed. Things that I looked for for my joy up until that time suddenly didn't look the same. People told me this would happen, but you know, as a 30-year-old, you're thinking, I've sort of figured most of this out by now, but I was wrong. I would have never known what I was missing. And if I went back and explained this to me, I wouldn't believe myself. In fact, if I had a time machine and I jumped in it today, I would go visit a few places. But let's say I went back to Kurt at age five out there on the farm on Cascade Highway. And I walked into Kurt's room and here there he is playing with the Thundercats on the floor. And I said, Kurt, one day you are going to marry a woman named Summer and you're going to have the two most amazing children and your life is going to be full of blessing. Little Kurt might look up to me and say, yeah, but... Will I be able to bring Lionel with me? Because see, for him, that's what happiness was. Present day me, 35-year-old me would look down and say, I can say that for three more days. 35-year-old me would look down and say, you're going to experience things that are so much better than this. But my five-year-old, it would be impossible for him to understand. And isn't that just like us? God offers you today true, real happiness. And we essentially say, yes, but can I bring my other toys with me? Do you see the challenge in that? To obtain the field. First, the man had to go back and sell everything he had. And to obtain the pearl, the merchant did the same. They couldn't have both. To take hold of the thing that was of infinite value. And for us to take hold of the thing that's of infinite value, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we all must relinquish our hold on the rotten rags of life on our own terms. We can't have both. We put our hand in the Savior's hand, but first to do that, you have to let go of all of the counterfeit treasure that you're clinging to. Many of you have read and know the works of C.S. Lewis, and one of my favorite quotes is this. We're still making mud pies in a slum because we don't believe in an offer of a holiday at the beach. Our problem is not that we love pleasure too much. Our problem is that we are too easily pleased. You see, we settle for cheap plastic imitations. Broken toys. We live in this world of rebellion against God when he's offering us something that is so satisfying, so wonderful that it should be in joy. We should be running through the streets saying, I'm leaving that all because I found something so much better. But we believe the lies from the enemy. Remember, it's the first lie he ever told. He told Eve in the garden, God is holding back good things from you. And we believe that lie. We believe that lie, that same lie echoing through eternity, that God is holding back good. He's holding back joy. But Jesus teaches us the exact opposite. Look at what Matthew 6.33 says. It says, Jesus speaking, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of this other stuff will be added to you. 
Jesus is giving you a concrete offer today. Remember, this comes in the context where he's talking about worrying about what they eat, what they wear, what they'll do. And Jesus says, here, I'll make a deal with you. Open your hands and let go of all of that. And hold on to me. And I will take care of all of the rest. Jesus says this to you today. If you will seek him first, If you will value him most, he will take care of the rest. And the treasure Jesus is offering you today is infinitely valuable. And he's offering it to you right now in exchange, in trade. Your filthy rags, your brokenness, your sickness, and your pain. In exchange for his life, his righteousness, and his joy. That is my friends, is a good trade. But many of us still struggle. We struggle with this trade because we have this built-in ingrained sense of fair and unfair. And so we can't accept God's grace because it's just simply unfair. I want you to think back then about that original life point that I gave you. The value you place on something is shown by what you will give up for it. I'm going to ask you now a question about what this life point says about your value to God. What did he, the father, give up in order to have you? His one and only son, Jesus. You see, that's another wonderful truth contained in this parable. The father is the one and the son is who searched through the field. And when they discovered a treasure, you, they said, I've got to have it. So he was willing to give his very best, Jesus Christ, in order to possess you, to have you. You are the pearl that the Father hunted for, searched for, over the whole earth, in order to find you. And when he found you, he said, you're mine. You are mine. And he gave up his son to have you. And let me ask you, this beautiful, priceless, wonderful treasure, you, that he's found, what was his attitude? Jesus' attitude towards possessing you, towards having you. Guess what? It's the same as the parable. We find it in Hebrews 12, chapter 1 through 3. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangled us. Let us run with perseverance the race that has been marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God, next to the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Just like the parable, Jesus sacrificed everything. And what was it motivated in and by? It was joy. Joy. Joy about what? having you be a part of his family. See, because Jesus knew the Father, and Jesus knew that the Father was exceedingly, abundantly good, and he knew that the Father had all of the joy, and so even though he was going to go through intense suffering, intense pain, it says that he looked forward with joy to having you be a part of his family. Nothing, nothing, nothing compares to his life, his kingdom, and his joy. I've got two points that I'm going to give you at the, as, as I finish this thing today that I want you to take home with you this week. I'm giving you homework, okay? There are two points that I want you to meditate on. Two points that I want you to allow God to speak to you through as each day, Each day this week, I'd like you to look back at these two points. The first one is this. Meditate on this. Number one, nothing in all the universe 
is more valuable than following Jesus and his kingdom. And we should joyfully lay everything down to pursue it. And just like it, point two, nothing in all the universe is more valuable to Jesus than to have a relationship with you. And he joyfully laid everything down in pursuit of you. We can listen to a sermon and think, okay, that's nice, and then go and go about normal business. But my challenge to you all this week is to consider how you view, how you see the offer that Jesus is giving you. Is it a treasure or is it a burden? And then secondly, as we pray today, I'm actually going to ask you to consider the things that you may be holding on to in your hands that you're hoping to bring along with you that maybe today, symbolically, you would open up your hands and release them to Jesus. I think there are so many things that we carry all the time that Jesus is saying, open your hands, come on. Let that go. I seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. For some of you parents, there are things like worrying about your kids. And you just feel like you've got to hold on to that. And he's saying, no, you can release that to me. I've got you covered. For others of you, it's pain. It's hurt. It's sickness. For others of you, it's your own possessions, your own wealth. For others of you, it's areas that you know God's called you to, but you're still holding on to something else. And Jesus is offering you today a better treasure in exchange. But first, you've got to let go of the things you're holding on to and take hold of him. So would you stand with me today as we pray? And I just want to encourage you to take a second. Think. If the Lord, if the Holy Spirit begins to speak something into your heart, even right now, that symbolically as we pray today, maybe you would take that thing and you just let it go. And you would, with me, with open hands, approach the Father today. Father, there is nothing more valuable than you. There's nothing more valuable than your son, Jesus. There's nothing better than the life that you have to offer. Nothing else will satisfy me. You alone are good. So today, I let go of all of these things that are holding me back or that I'm holding on to. And I cling to you, Jesus, alone. You promised that if we would come to you first, if we would seek you first, that you would care for all of those things. And so today in trust, we're coming to you and saying, yes, I let go and I cling to you, Jesus. And I pray as we leave this place today, that your Holy Spirit would remind us of this commitment and would remind us when we're holding on to things that we don't need to hold on to, that we can open our hands and place our hands into the loving, gracious, powerful hands of him. I trust you, God. For many of you, you need to just start right there. I trust you, God. And for a lot of you, that may be a sticking point. I trust you, God. So in your son Jesus' name, I give these things to you. And thank you that you have sought me, searched for me, found me, and made me your own. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails.
this virtual environment right now, I still want to take this time to teach you guys a new song this morning. It's one that just kind of talks about the, a couple of the promises that God makes to us while we're here on this earth. And one is that he'll always be here with us, moving in our lives um, and in this world. And I think it's something that we need to hold on to while we're in this situation right now. So let's sing this together. You are here.
thank you, God, that you keep all of your promises, that you are our light in the darkness, that you are a miracle worker. Lord, we just sing this morning, that is who you are. Lord, we ask, would you work in our lives today? Would you bring miracles? Would you bring light into our darkness? Lord, we worship you here in this place today. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. We believe that we are better together. We want for you to be part of a small group so that you can be in relationship with others who will pray for you and encourage you. If you're interested in joining a small group, please fill out a connection card and we'll be in touch with more information about a group that you can join. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you soon.